Welcome back. This is World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. As the coronavirus spreads to new hosts around the world, the emergence of the Delta variant, thought to be twice as infectious and deadlier, is adding fuel to a fire that has never stopped raging. The world sought answers to its origins. But geopolitical tensions get in the way of scientifically uncovering COVID-19's beginnings. It's valuable work which could help prevent future pandemic. So how could scientists collaborate on this serious public health inquiry? And also, how can it be steered away from politicization? What to work on the Delta variant? A Chinese think tank report came out on Monday trying to describe these challenges once again. A nearly 70-page long report on the truth about the U.S. fight against COVID-19 has been released, compiled by researchers and scholars from three major think tanks in China, including one based at Beijing's Renmin University. The report says over 600,000 Americans have lost their lives to the virus due to the mismanagement of the crisis, pointing out some U.S. media still rated the country number one in the world for its pandemic response. Uh, ridiculous, absurd example is the Bloomberg and other reporting that, you know, on a ranking, COVID resilience ranking, the United States uh, comes number one. I mean, this is really, this is... This, is, this can't be taken seriously. COVID-19 was probably the greatest test of governance the world has seen since the Second World War. The report also argues that the U.S. is undermining the global response to the pandemic by allowing the virus to spread in its borders and around the world, worsening the situation. That's the content of the report. But comparing to the academic summaries, the Delta variant is spreading like wildfire and needs real solutions now. So let's loop in our panelists who are real scientists. For more on the latest challenge uh, to the world, uh, the Delta variant and the global pandemic, we are joined in New York by Jeff Slagmelch, who is the director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University's Earth Institute in San Francisco, Peter Chin Hong, professor and associate dean for regional campuses with the School of Medicine from University of California, San Francisco. Last but not least, in New Haven, Xi Chen, associate professor of health policy and economics at Yale School of Public Health. Gentlemen, what a pleasure to see all of you. Things are getting very challenging. Uh, Jeff, I understand that more than 100,000 cases every day, Delta variant in the U.S. right now. Yeah, and of course, these are just the cases that we're able to confirm through testing, and it's believed to be much higher than that. And what we're seeing in the U.S. is, is parts of the country, the states where you have lower vaccination rates is where those positivity rates uh, are, are both higher and also translating into more severe disease, higher hospitalization rates, and unfortunately higher deaths in areas with higher vaccination. Uh, we're seeing um, still increased in infections, but, uh, but not the same level of increase with the uh, severe illness and deaths. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chen Hong, uh, I understand that the trend, according to some health officials and uh, researchers, is going from the south of the U.S., where the vaccination rate is not necessarily high, to the north now, where the vaccination rate is much higher than the south. How should we understand this? Well, as Jeff pointed out, it all has to do with vaccination rates. But overall, we are not seeing as many deaths in the country as we did in the darkest days. And that's because we've vaccinated more than 85% of seniors uh, in general. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones who were disproportionately affected in terms of hospital resources. Um, and again, you know, although we're seeing a lot of infections, when you look at the vaccinated, uh, highly vaccinated states, uh, it's not translating into a lot of hospitalizations or deaths. At the end of the day, if we have enough resources in the hospital to adequately take care of the people who come in, I think we're okay, but that's kind of bursting at the seams in some parts of the country. Right. I was listening to some uh, specific reports regarding that. Uh, the number of hospital beds in the emergency room is running to single digit, uh, Chen. Uh, I mean, that shows the challenge that the U.S. is facing right now together with some of the other countries in the world. 
Yeah, indeed, uh, some uh, uh, states, especially in the south, uh, Texas, uh, uh, Florida, they are running short of hospital beds, and largely because of a large number of unvaccinated people. So this is uh, a pandemic, but uh, the pandemic is changing in its nature. It's more of a pandemic for those unvaccinated and uh, for their household family members who are unable to be vaccinated for now. So we see the deaths and the hospitalization are dramatically down among uh, vaccinated. And uh, for those people who are vaccinated, the link between the infection numbers and the deaths appear to be weakening. But for unvaccinated, it's a still a very harsh situation. Mm. Mr. Slagmausch, um, a lot of people were trying to understand the fact that how come you know, uh, the U.S. with, uh, shall we say, the most advanced economy and possibly one of the best uh, uh, medical situations in terms of resources in the world uh, uh, is now still suffering uh, once again in such a way uh, by the uh, Delta variant. Uh, how should we reconcile this, these facts? Yeah, and I, I think looking within the U.S. as well as across the world, it's sort of where you're looking at, right? And as my colleagues have, have mentioned as well, you know, mm -hmm. if you're looking at areas with high vaccination rates, you may see some spread, but you're not seeing that translate into the severe conditions and in other areas uh, where it is. And I think that ultimately comes down at this point to choice, as a lot of people have chosen not to get vaccinated. And there's a lot of reasons for that, some legitimate, some more politicized. Uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of people have chosen not to get vaccinated early on, and we're hearing stories of folks who are regretting that decision and, and urging others to get vaccinated. And we're seeing increases in vaccination rates after seeing really the damage that the Delta variant is causing, in addition to other variants that are circulating. Mm -hmm. But but it, it really is a matter of place in terms of where you're looking at in areas where people have chosen to get high, more vaccinations you're not seeing. Uh, she, uh, we've been talking to each other since the very beginning of the uh, information that there were a pandemic called uh, COVID-19. We see that waves after waves of uh, COVID coming back uh, and also challenging in such a devastating way. What do you think is the biggest takeaway since you are based in U.S. Uh, in the United States of all these different waves, especially with the Delta this time? Yeah, I think one hard lesson is uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. This is true not only globally, but also within the U.S. We see the virus spreading among those unvaccinated. Uh, although there's no immediate um, uh, threat to those vaccinated, but with more uh, mutations, more replications of the virus, this will eventually spill over to the large group of people who are already vaccinated. We're becoming a threat to all the people in the U.S. And same is true for uh, the, at the global level. And we see that there's a very uh, uneven distribution of the vaccines. And uh, the, for example, WHO's uh, distribution has faced with a supply shortfall. And uh, uh, the, the commercial uh, entities they try to marketing their third dose of vaccines worldwide without uh, taking adequate care of uh, countries with uh, uh, less uh, fewer vaccines for the, even the first two doses. So those are all require more adequate and timely coordination among countries. And uh, I think all the policies, if we can follow science better, then we are in a much better situation. So this pandemic taught us that, uh, uh, including something we just discussed about the masking mandate and uh, was uh, removed and uh, reimposed. So those mm -hmm. things are, are taught, uh, teaching us that we should be humble about what we know and what we don't know, and always guided by the science and inflow, uh, information will be flowing and we will learn new things and mm -hmm. recognize uh, errors in our previous understandings. It's very important to uh, correct those mi mistakes immediately after we know that and right. have more effective public communications. So information has to be updated uh, constantly and has to be taken by the public at the time when those information are out. What is that communication, you know, being done in the U.S. right now, you know, between the public and the scientific community, the policymakers, you know, at the 
federal level, uh, state level, and even a lower local level. How is that being done? How come there's so much confusion? Well, I think in a lot of cases, when it comes to scientific information, it, it comes down to uh, how is it being used. And for quite a time, it was being used very differently by different political parties. Now, we're seeing some coming together now, not universal, but where the various political parties are all starting to say the same thing, get the vaccine. Uh, but mask mandates, I mean, I mean, the U.S. is a very uh, society very much based on individualism and individualistic freedoms. And so when you tell someone they have to do something, when you tell someone they have to wear a mask, it, it strikes to the core of that. And there are those that reject that. And I think that um, really the best efforts out there are to work with community leaders, work with folks, as my colleague said, you know, masks are a temporary measure. Um, and there is a lot that we do know about the virus. It's when we try to get overly precise or play with the politics of this that we start to get into trouble. Right. Peter. Where a lot of emphasis has been placed on, I think rightly so, is vaccinations. And I think what had dipped in the interim was testing behaviors, uh, emphasis on masking, and, and so on. You know, and now uh, various states are coming back with some of these other almost like old fashioned advice. So I think, you know, people were very optimistic about reopening society. We were thinking that the vaccines would be the way out particularly in some states like California, New York, uh, heavily vaccinated, um, you know, and many parts of New England, for example. Now that you have Delta and you're turning back the clock, this is like a big moral blow, a big psychological blow to a lot of people out there. And so it's leading to a lot of uh, anger. It's leading to, um, you know, mistrust of what public health is saying. For example, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, wearing masks in bars and personally I've been getting some hate mail from bar owners saying that I was demonizing bars uh, when I was just really speaking about the increased risk I need to wear the mask mm -hmm. you know again you're never going to satisfy all parts of th this individual society uh, you you know one size doesn't fit all in the U.S. Well, you know, there are so many theories as to why the systems work and the systems didn't work. Uh, there are numerous reports coming out of uh, various think tanks for whatever reasons uh, about the reasons and the, uh, you know, the prospects. But, you know, at the end of the day, it seems that, gentlemen, there's uh, some of the basic rules that just populations have to follow in terms of a public health uh, crisis. I really wonder, there's really that much difference in terms of political systems, economic development stages, you know, any one of these would really uh, matter in front of uh, the virus and a global pandemic. Last year, we thought we could come out of it at the end of last year or earlier this year, and we didn't. And now, looking at the spread of Delta variant, it's very unlikely that we'll be able to do that within this year. So as l long as the time drags on, there will be exhaustion, there will be further disbelief, distrust. Um, how are we going to handle this situation? How are we going to solve this problem? I think, you know, it's, it's so hard way. You know, we have COVAX, we have world organizations coming together, but it hasn't really led to uh, the distribution in a timely way. Again, time is everything with variants, like you mentioned, you know. Right. Sure, we could eventually vaccinate the world, maybe, with some more generics and, uh, you know, uh, sharing of uh, intellectual property. But, you know, again, if we don't do it in time, today is Delta, tomorrow is Delta Plus, then it's Lambda, and then you're going to run out of Greek alphabet letters. Um, it's really difficult since many rich countries are talking about giving third shots, people are getting fourth shots, uh, and then that's not even in all members of these countries. And then you have like some members not even getting it. And then you have 85% uh, of countries uh, with less than 1% of, of vaccine. So it really is kind of bleak, but at the end of the day, um, you know, there are other vaccines in, in progress. Uh, you know, yeah. COVAX is picking up a little bit. It's, it's tough. Jeff? Yeah, I, I mean, I think what I would start by saying is that I, I, I do think we're going to get through this, uh, that we are going to get through to the other side. We are seeing the value of the vaccines. We've actually seen unprecedented speed and development 
uh, and new mechanisms for purchasing and distributing vaccines. That being said, it's not where it should be. The road out of this pandemic is going to be harder and longer and unfortunately more deadly than it should be. But we have folks engaged from the public sector to the private sector looking at this problem from angles we haven't looked at before with ideas and, and thinking that we haven't had before. Uh, this won't be the last pandemic we face. We face other problems mm. at the intersection of science and social science and hard sciences. Um, but I do think, I, and agree with you, we need to find these sources of inspiration, both to carry us through this pandemic and into the challenges that the future will bring us. But I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic on my end. She. Yeah, I think uh, with this pandemic ongoing and with so many, uh, already one year and more than one year and a half, uh, uh, went by and we gradually all the all the countries are uh, gradually realized that we have to learn how to manage the threat manage the virus in, and also gradually step by step by uh, resuming and uh, reopening the economy social economic activities so how to do that better to in the face of such a once in a century pandemic i think at the global stage uh, countries are at a different phase of the reopening and they have very different strategies so I would encourage all countries to learn from each other. Thank you so much for every one of you for joining us and sharing your thoughts from an expert's perspective. Uh, Jeff uh, Slegmelsch, Peter Chin Hong, Xi Chen, really appreciate it, gentlemen. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more Search World Inside, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.